looks like we're uh, starting a, another SEL Pros Helpline hang Hangout. And today we're going to go back to where we kind of went in the dojo last week with uh, technical SEO for e-commerce. It was a great uh, uh, hangout that received uh, a lot of accolades from the members. So uh, this one will be public and people will be able to view it uh, on the uh, SEO Pro site or in our YouTube page. And so to get started, uh, I'll start by introducing Scott Pope. Do you want to tell people a bit about yourself, Scott, and start that way? Yeah, I think you're muted, Scott. Not quite. How be we start with Hamlet then? Let him introduce himself while Scott works out the uh, voice problem. If you're coming in from Skype, that's awfully uh, often the problem, Scott. Uh, it kind of inhibits uh, Google+. Plus. Okay, Hamlet, it's uh, over to you. Okay, Hamlet Batista here. I blog at hamletbatista.com. Uh, I'm an all-around SEO geek, and I love uh, data and and um, and validated uh, SEO recommendations. I focus primarily on e-commerce, and uh, work primarily on medium and enterprise sites, which are uh, come up with really technical and interesting problems where I can apply my skills. Oh, great. Uh, Scott's going to be working on his audio here, so he'll either shake his head yes or no, and we'll, we'll move on like that. How's that, Scott? And up in the top right, there's some settings you might check there, or uh, if you're logged into Skype, it often takes over uh, audio uh, and video. Just a... Uh, okay. So the first question... Uh, Thing that I want to kind of talk about and we'll go over it pretty quickly is uh, the custom cart uh, versus the uh, you know out of the box Magento uh, open cart is one I use uh, there's Magento and a few others what do you think of those Hamlet yeah so um, so it depends a lot with uh, with the needs of the business, um, uh, the, I'm 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 more in favor of uh, uh, customized uh, packages. Uh, some vendors they you you mentioned you know customized you mentioned also package ones. There are vendors that also provide um, that provide their the their solution plus their, the source code of it, so that you can actually customize it. I'm not a big fan of starting from scratch unless you're working with really small sites or um, thinking about it, I have clients that have very specific needs. For example, you know, they have a rental service, you know, like they, that, that's something that is not uh, one of the package solutions, you know, it's very customized. You might face, you know, other examples like that or, or another client that is selling, you know, music, you know, that they need to have ability to sell uh, videos stream music or, or, or sell uh, physical goods you know ship the uh, ship uh, DVDs or, or packages so in that case you know it's, it's it will be probably a challenge just to uh, find something and tweak it um, but if you can get something already built either you know an open source package like Magento or, or OS Commerce or one of these packages, or one of the vendors, you know, like ATG, that they'll provide you with a source code to the system. You know, you build on top of that. In any system, regardless of you know, you know how good it is, you know, you have to do, you still have to do a lot of work to make you know the SEO right. Um, for example, Magento, one of the first things we have to do is, is, is fix the the review system. So the reviews, they they show up in different pages instead of showing up in the same product page. Uh, and, and, and different things like that. The chronicalization that they have built in is not the best, it's not the ideal, or how they handle the pagination. Um, so it's, um, I would say it's, uh, it depends. That's, you know, depends yeah. on, on. And they can uh, always go to middleware like uh, you provide to 
get over any problems they're having. Scott, you're working with some, uh, you can introduce yourself now and talk a little bit about the platforms that you work on with the bigger clients that you have. Uh, the, uh, voice no still. Okay. <laughs> One of those days, Google. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll just uh, kind of, we, the carts are, can be either one or half dozen other. A lot of it has to do, like uh, Hamlet said, if you can only afford to get an open source free cart, then by all means, get started with whatever you can. That's basically pick something within your budget. And the thing to remember is that you got to have budget when you're done in order to promote the uh, shopping cart or your store. It's not just going to sell itself. How about Scott? You want to try now? Still shaking his head. Okay, well, we'll just keep moving along then. No problem at all. Nothing stops us here. So we kind of touched on the uh, shopping carts, and then you get down to the inherent problems in all shopping carts and what a lot of uh, e-commerce SEO is uh, taking care of things like, uh, let's start with duplicate content and talk a bit about using uh, RHEL Previous, Next, uh, and the canonicalization uh, of uh, URLs. Uh, Hamlet, uh, are you ready, Scott? Can you yeah. talk? Yeah, yeah I figured it out. Oh, great. Great. That's great. I know... Uh, okay, tell me, the, tell me uh, you're not using Windows. That's probably the... Yeah, what? You're using <laughs> Windows. Windows. <laughs> Windows is never a problem. It's always the operator. It's a DFO uh, issue. Oh, uh, okay. Stands for a dumb F operator. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what so, yeah, I might... Go ahead. Uh, if you want to, too, you could uh, start by telling us a bit about yourself, Scott, so we know more, and maybe a bit about the platforms you're on, and then uh, segue into how you use canonicals and other uh, means of handling outages of stock, etc. Uh, sure, absolutely. Now, uh, I've been doing SEO probably for, well, since about 97. I've done in-house agency consulting um, the works. Uh, now running my own agency once again, very happy, wish I would have done this six years ago. Uh, but anyway, with e-commerce sites, yeah, what I've really come to find out that anything that you purchase out there is always going to need customization. Um, and it really comes down to that when you're looking for e-commerce platforms, you want to make sure that you're able to customize. And what I usually recommend to any client or business that we're working with is the fact that, you know what, what do you want to be able to customize? Just say everything for the simple fact that you may need to be able to customize the URL structures, the way things are categorized, any part of the information architecture all the way down. Um, as long as we can customize things, I have no platform preference whatsoever, to be completely honest. I've worked in almost every environment there is. Yeah, some of them are a little tougher, though, when you have proprietary languages, like with well, Magento and some of the others. Yes, to an extent, yes, but in the other sense, I always blame it on the developers. For a simple fact, if a developer is smart enough to understand the platform they're working in, then they can make the changes that I am requiring in order to, you know, for the recommendations. If they can't, well, then let's just find another developer. It's that simple. I, I, I was a developer. I was IT security, IT architecture for many, many years. So, I mean, I know these things can happen. So when people tell me that they can't, I call bullshit. It's that simple. Yeah. I have to disagree. I have to disagree there, uh, and it is... Uh, you know, <laughs> companies they have they have bureaucracy, they have uh, mm -hmm. they have internal systems. You know, they have websites that have multiple CMS, you know, running at the same time. And then the the navig the the breadcrumbs are powered by this X system. This other stuff is powered by this other system. And that's why you know we are in the business in the first place. We provide you know uh, the middleware to be able to make you know these SEO changes easy. You know, like every every client is different. You know, and sometimes you know the the IT people they're trying to the best, but they're limited by the software. Just to give you an idea, Westphere is one of the most prevalent uh, platforms. You know, at the top tier of clients, and IBM. You know, you know these, these installations are millions of dollars, 
and and we challenge them all the time, saying, you know, why we can do this? Why would you know? And they say, okay, it's on a roadmap. But the roadmap is is they they write the roadmap in years. They're not talking about weeks or months. They're talking about deploying stuff in years. They say, oh, we're gonna we're gonna fix that in release X. That is gonna be released in 2017. You understand? So what do you do? <laughs> you understand? And and unfortunately, ideally, you know, they should give out the source code. I, ITG does that, right? So ITG, you know, if you want to make the changes yourself, you, you you make them. But but IBM, you know, they don't. Westfield, they don't they don't provide it. So you well, put, the developers, they can they can create modules and make changes, but not everything is is easy to, to fix. And generally, well, as much as I, I agree with you, you, I disagree with you. <laughs> Well, that's good. We like to, to see, a, you know, a debate. And that was well, what I mean, was good about yeah. the last one as well. It's always well. No, absolutely. And I mean, look, you yeah. get a hundred, you get a hundred SEOs in a room and ask them the same question. You're going to get at least two hundred different answers. And the thing is, they're all actually correct. It really depends, just as Hamlet said, depends on the situation and where you're at and the bureaucracy and everything. And I mean, even when I was working at at Edmonds and we had just upgraded to a brand new million dollar. CMS system, which at the time was Day uh, Day by uh, Day Communicate, and uh, you know the thing is, of course, the salespeople always said, "Oh yes, you can customize everything. You can control yeah, the URL exactly. structures all you want." Bullshit. It took us quite some time writing modules and getting into the custom source code. And oh sure, we'll do that. And just as you said, they put it in their queue, and it won't get published until 2017. So yeah, you really have to be able to get into an organization and take control. Of what you want. I mean, Edmonds for me is a is a prime example. Even though it's not specifically e-commerce, it's still lead generation. Um, I mean, we took it from 3.5 million uniques a month to 16.5 million uniques a month in less than four years because we took full control over everything. SEO became an integrated process. There wasn't one single project or product that was ever launched on Edmonds that did not go through SEO approval. Period. We had executive buy-in at the highest levels, and it was beautiful. I mean, it was it, you know, it's a wet dream. That's usually a big part yeah. of success too. When you start dealing with bigger companies, as you know, is the guy at the top buying into this? If he hasn't, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was obviously, most hated person at the company. <laughs> yeah, obviously, you know, it can be done. You know, it's just what I'm saying is, it's not just you know, IT people's fault. You know, it's you have to drive through all the obstacles. Well, and, uh, you're absolutely correct. It's it's education, and our job as SEOs or as software providers, like what you're doing as well, is to make sure we educate the business units, the IT units, the development units on what needs to be done and why it needs to be done. Yeah, yeah, and provide the tools at the end of the day because if, if the tools are not useful, it's not are not enough. You'd need better tools, um, and that's where we spend most of our time on making yeah. things better. And in speaking about tools, those are usually uh, pretty uh, fundamental to what I want to talk about next, and that's uh, where you get duplicate content, uh, duplicate navigation, content, duplicate content caused by navigation, which uh, you know used to there used to be lots of ways to hide navigation, but Google just keeps taking them away. I used to hide everything in forms. Because they couldn't go through. Well, now you can use the form, mm -hmm. but if you put a drop-down box, uh, you might as well uh, put a link there. Because uh, you know they're following them. Yeah, even in cases where you know we've used iframes, which I hate iframes, but iframes for stuff that we needed to remove for from the on-page overall score, we've now see looks like it's actually being included in. Just like you know JavaScript, Ajax, Flash, all these things, even though they used to be fully external elements. And you know, had their weight on their own. They're now all integrated into the page you resign. Yeah. yeah. What I do is I, I just have the clients don't follow the the, the the navigation links. I don't want the bots to follow the the fashion navigation links. There's no follow them, and the bots don't follow them. Yeah. See, I'm I'm a huge proponent of never using no follow. Um, back to the day it was it was invented or you know created as far as its purpose. You only know follow links you don't trust. So there is never going to be yeah. a single link on any website internally that I know follow. I will only know follow external links that are ads, and that's it. Period. That's what it, it is for me too, Scott. I believe uh, search engines don't tell me when to use no follow. I know when I should use no follow. They well, absolutely. Don't have and, more, and, yeah, you know, I'm, and, and, I'm less I'm less philosophical on that and more empirical, and and it's worked it's worked great to avoid you know all well, the, sure. the, the 
the infinite loops, the, the infinite crawl space. Well, and, and you're absolutely right in that aspect, but I'm also uh, you know, a big, huge proponent of fixing my architecture before I ever use a Band-Aid that Google gives us. And that yeah, comes so the so I don't well. think it's a Band-Aid because you know, the guided navigation it has a lot of value for the users. You know, The fast well, navigation yeah. is very, very it's great for users. I, I yeah, agree I, with that, I, but there are still technical solutions to it. Yeah, there is no right and wrong there because uh, the reason that me and Scott wouldn't do that is, is we might not do that particular thing that you're doing that you're no following, right? Uh, to me, it's like uh, everything is situational. The, you know, I, I no follow links to my own sites off my clients because, you know, some of them actually say, I want your link on my site. To show that I was, you know, built by a professional, not by my, uh, you know, uncle's uh, son. Uh, so, but I always know follow those and uh, anything that points to my site from a client, always know follow that. Not because it's not trustworthy, is uh, I otherwise I'm stealing. Uh, well, not stealing is a bit much, but yeah, it I'm dissolves anyway. Benefit from my uh, client site. I'm siphoning PR off it. Maybe not a lot, but some. So it's not my place to do that. Anyhow, we kind of strayed off a bit there. Back to the uh, canonicalization. And I know that uh, we may have a, a disagreement here again because I'm a big believer in the uh, uh, previous and next uh, rel. And I know uh, that's not a big one uh, for uh, Hamlet. He made that clear to me last week. In the dojo's uh, Friday hangout, so uh, no, as since I, I said, said I'd like to use that one for. No, I said it gives I, me more control. No, I have clients that have are using pagination tags, or I have clients that use the canonicals. It's based on I, I based it primarily on the speed of the pages. You understand? If pages take too long to load. You know, I don't I don't want to use the canonicals because uh, yeah, it's not going to be a great a great user experience. But I, um, I I go with the pagination tax instead. But if 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 the page is a little fast, it's better. I I rather use the canonical to the pat to the view all page, um, and and Google have some some tests that the users prefer that instead of you know they're searching for something you know if you get give them the page that has everything they're more likely to find what they're looking for rather than you know probably landing on a on a page in the set. That might not be the exact page that they're looking for, and then they have to, you know, click for, you know, back and forth to find the item. Yeah, so it's I more like the shopping carts that the view all is actually an option for the user, and leave that up to them uh, where it should be. Yeah, not yeah, shooting the search engine a whole bunch of, you know, basically if you're shooting a search engine a hundred records with two hundred links on them, you're not going to get them all followed. I don't care, you know what people think they're not being followed and trusted at some point. Uh, Scott, what do you think yeah, about more this? Than well, I, I use a canonical and I use, I use all of them, to be honest. I use every tool and every tool that Google provides. <laughs> I, my issue with it is, and it's, it's partly philosophical and the other part is just from experience, is I don't trust Google for these types of situations. I trust my own architecture and my own abilities for this. Uh, will I use them? Yes, absolutely. Is that hypocritical? Probably not. I don't think so, but maybe some people might think. Um, but I like to fix things with an architecture. I, I don't like to rely upon Google. I mean, there's numerous cases out there where Google has fixed something. Six months later, the same issue reappears because somebody forgot to check in that part of the code the last time they ran the update. I mean, you know, Google's algorithm is software, and if somebody forgets to check in something, then the 302 hijack page, which the, hijacking, which keeps coming back year after year after year. I mean, one day they can decide that canonical tags are no longer useful and they don't want to treat them that way, just like Rama to follow after people, you know, use the living hell out of that. So I think it's good to use the tools that are there, absolutely, but I don't rely upon it. I try to fix everything I can with architecture. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm partially in agreement with that. I've seen instances where, where there are things that are obviously, you know, bugs in Google. Like, for example, at clients, where their cache page, they have, for example, they have an international site with different domains in different uh, countries. And it, it was something really interesting that when we check the cache page of one of the domains, for example, in Venezuela, 
we saw the cash page of the site from Colombia. We saw all, all that happening all over the place, and it caused a lot of traffic to decline. Mm -hmm. So we performed some experiments to see what, what might be causing this. We couldn't find any problems. We reported it to Google, and they admitted there was a problem on their end. So it's software. They, they have these bugs. But what I do is I use their tools, and I'm measuring all the time. You know, everything that I do, I try to measure it. And I try to see whether, you know, I, 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 I'm always looking at the logs, looking at whether Google is crawling, you know. I, even when I set the URL parameters, I see if Google is behaving the way it's supposed to behave based on the URL parameters. And it's never 100% the way that they're supposed to behave. So, so yeah, you, you, you have to listen to what they say, test it. But you can just blindly assume that things are going to happen the way they say they're going to happen. Like, I initially... When I started, like five, you know, when I, like five years ago, I thought that duplicate pages were not supposed to perform. You know, they were not supposed to be indexed. You know, and then I came to, oh, how are all these duplicate pages indexed? They're still indexed. And then I saw, I found instances where, even in pages that are not canonicalized, you see the duplicate pages performing. You know, like pages from this exactly the same duplicates, all of them getting traffic. You go to Google Analytics, you'll see that. You know. One of them gets the most traffic, but you see the other ones getting traffic. It shouldn't be that way, right? So you see all this stuff when you go really and you dive in into the data. And that's what I'm, I focus so much and try to validate everything I do, and I look, look so closely at the data. Because things are not the way they're supposed to be, you know, 100% of the time, you know. If we get, you know, 60, 80%, that, that, that's fantastic. Yeah, we're a bit like baseball players. In that uh, thing, if we get three out of ten, we're probably doing pretty good. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so uh, the canonicalization and duplicate content. Per personally, uh, when I was building uh, carts, uh, I never worried about it much. I tried to cover up any duplicate navigation, but uh, personally, I didn't care. I want people to be able to find stuff by the brand. So I'm not going to hide that just because Google will index it and make duplicate content. This was before canonicalization and there were really any tools. You just lived with it and made sure that what you wanted to get into the index got there and was supported enough that it didn't go into the supplemental. It went into the good index. Well, so, I can tell you, I can tell you that Duplicate content and canonicalization is usually where my clients see the biggest lift in traffic, you know, in the short amount of time. Uh, and that is primarily because the, the duplication is just diluting their links. You know what I'm saying? You have duplicate pages, usually all those pages are getting links, and these pages are competing against each other. When we canonicalize, we consolidate all the links into a canonical page, and that page performs better. That's, you know, at the top of my list with all clients and all the audits that I do, you know, it's generally the big, uh, the lowest hanging fruit, because it's like you're you're getting links without having to go after them. You know what I'm saying? Same thing with you when uh, sites do redesigns and they don't properly map the pages, they get all these, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of four four errors. Sometimes you know hundreds of thousands or more. Uh, these are you know low hanging fruit opportunities to increase the performance for these e-commerce sites, because you know. E-commerce sites, they change platform often, you know, the CMSs are not designed for, for addressing duplicate content efficiently and presenting the bots in just one single way to get to the content piece. So it's generally, uh, from a performance perspective, generally the, the, the highest impact uh, activity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I would I'd agree on that. I mean, for me, it's, again, it's about architecture. If a product URL, do not use categorizations, don't use anything else in that URL, just the product. So it's yeah, that's, main that's dot com forward slash product, and oh my god, how can you ever duplicate that? You yeah, can't. That's, I mean, that's a great, with that's query a great parameters, idea. filtering things of that nature, absolutely. But if your product is always at the same URL or in the same directory, for every single product you have, I don't care how many it is, then it's right there. Leave your, you know, your user, your UX navigation as its own pathing system, and that's going to be, you know, have multiple funnels getting down to your, drilling down to your products, and that's absolutely fine. But put all your URLs in a single place. You, you know, you eliminate 90% of the problems that any CMS or, you know, e-commerce platform is going to give you. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. That's, that's the ideal. The problem is that, again, you know, it's not applicable to every client because, you know, right. everybody's going to just rewrite their, their, their architecture. You have to adapt to what they have already. 
So if you're starting from scratch or you're doing a massive redesign that includes, you know, real, real changes, that's the absolute best uh, approach. It's for a single for a simple reason that if you add the category to the URL and the product is listed in more than one, which is an example, then you have two duplicate URLs leading to the same product. Yeah. Right. Just yeah. I mean, unless the the client itself is not ranking for a damn thing because they've got their architecture sort of screwed up. It's oh, that's a base. Well, that's that's <laughs> that's very rare, right? It's very, I oh. mean, it's, it's a serious product. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes is, sometimes isn't. I mean, I've worked with a guy that you know had 500 products, six million pages indexed in Google at one point in time because of all the different variations in, in the ordering of the parameters and you know all of this stuff. And yeah, I mean, but the good news is rewrote them. He never exactly, anything. exactly, but the good news of that is that when you fix it, they see significant growth in, in traffic. Absolutely. It was a massive dilution of, of link equity on the, on the site. Well, yeah, massive dilution on link equity. You've got internal duplicate content. Uh, you've just got issues with, with the thin content in most cases with e-commerce. I mean, especially if you, you know, your descriptions aren't unique to begin with. You know, I mean, if you've got the same description that the manufacturer puts out and 600,000 other websites are selling the same product, how are you going to stand out? Exactly. You know, it all compounds together. Uh, duplications of one of my uh, clients, they had like, 700 uh, locations, let's say, and uh, <laughs> those 700 pages were on 1,500 other sites. So, uh, you know, I, the thing is, I think when I looked at it, I said, okay, let's take these pages down. We actually lost rankings because of it. And so I said, you know, I'm putting them back up because every other fool in our niche has done the same thing. So I'm actually hurting yeah. myself by doing the right thing. So I put them back up. And that's but the part that really sucks. Oh, they're unique. Yeah, There's I mean, you know, we've got people that are out there competing with clients I've got right now that are doing microsites, and they're the lowest quality crap there is. My client keeps going, well, let's do some microsites. I'm like, no, <laughs> no. But they're ranking. And the thing is, I can't tell them that it's not ranking, that it doesn't work. It's just, unfortunately, it's not a long-term strategy for him. And lo and behold, after about a year, you know, all of these other sites and their main site went down on their, uh, from their competitors. So, I mean, it does eventually catch up with people. I mean, it's, if your client can hold out, then it's better to go with a long-term strategy, in my opinion. I mean, I'm all about churn and burn stuff. I Don't get me wrong. I have nothing against any type of coloration of, of SEO there is, but it depends on your client. Yeah, but I think, too, uh, Google looks at that kind of microsite, uh, Scott, and kind of says, are they doing this to build a network of sites exactly. to manipulate us? Are they actually trying to do niche sites for their users? Well, it's, see, I mean, yeah, yeah but I mean, that's, that's almost kind of drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit as well, Terry. <laughs> yeah, well, I've seen it work too much and, and worked for years. It goes both ways. It goes well, both ways. I have I have a couple of clients from microsites, and I I say listen all these sites they have to be completely independent from yours, because uh, you link them up, you still run the risk of, of Google not liking that stuff saying oh you're just building a link farm, and uh, I I've been I I being a reformed black hat you know I've seen how how dramatic it is when you when you get uh, when you get penalized, and. Uh, I try to be more cautious and tell clients, you know, try this separately. But I have all the all the clients that the microsites are completely brands on their own. You know what I'm saying? When they have these microsites, you know, like in the travel industry, like this 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 microsite represents, you know, a hotel represents, you know, also represents uh, something unique that is 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 an entity on on its own. And then then there is not a problem. Because it's not just building up this site to 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 power uh, to build a link farm, so there's like the variations in uh, in between of of what looks as obvious manipulation and why you can say at least you have an excuse to say why this exists in the first place. Yeah, to an extent. extent. Yeah. Uh, okay. The moving on uh, when it comes to duplicate content, uh, Google has said that. Uh, Duplicate titles and uh, meta descriptions are uh, not a good thing. Uh, I kind of, that's one of the things that, as far as duplicate content, I'm pretty 
that's where I am studious because that's pretty easy to fix. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree. Yeah, and, and, and the reason is very simple, right? You know, if you have two different pages, uh, you know, with different content, different product, why would you have the same title? It doesn't make any sense. You know, you can be lazy. I mean, and, and the way when I, when I think about titles and I tell clients titles and meta descriptions, these are generally your search snippets. Their search snippets are kind of like your ads. If you're running an ad work campaign, in a sense, you're not going to be lazy and put the same ad across the board, across all campaigns and all ad groups, right? You'll try to make it compelling and speak directly to the user. So SEO value aside, you want to make a case for the user to click on your, on your, on your, on your listing and avoid your, your competitors in the SERP page, in the SERP, in the SERP yeah. results. Yeah, I mean, your, your meta description tag is your one and only chance to influence that snippet as much as you possibly can. I mean, of course, it's based on the query what they're going to show, but it's your one chance. So put your best effort into it, even if it's not an SEO factor. Yeah. And uh, lastly, I, I wanted to talk about something that's pretty, well, just for, like, e-commerce sites and maybe a few, uh, like, job sites uh, or uh, lead generating sites where you have uh, shorted inventory shortages, outages, and then what I call end of life of a product which means, uh, you know, that's never going to be produced again. How do you uh, deal with it? Uh, I like on end of line, I always have related products included, so I leave that page up. Mm -hmm. The simple reason being, just because it's end of line does not mean people stop searching for it. Usually, it's months before you see people stop searching for uh, those things. I learned this working with uh, guitars where those model numbers change all the time but the actual model never changes. In other words, a Gibson SG is always a Gibson SG but the actual model numbers change. Yeah. And in a, a database that changes and that looks like a new product when it's not. So you uh, I'm just saying that there's, you know, for uh, uh, the shortages are easy. You just put temporarily out of stock. Uh, and I also like to tell my clients, when you got shortages, anything that's on sale, take the sale off. Get as much as you can for it. And when you get the stock back in, because the worst thing a store can do is not have the product when the people are there to buy, number one. Uh, then uh, and the related items are good all the time because uh, and I don't mean when someone buys a guitar they buy the hand the polisher and all that stuff I mean like related guitars to that one because say for instance with the guitars you have cut away you have different shapes for something that was basically called the same thing so, yeah, I mean, in a case like that, personally, what I would do is if there is an update, like, we'll use an easy example, though. If there's an updated model, then in that, on that page, I'll just display the updated model, that pricing information, but use the, you know, the, the, the same page to rank for what it was previously to rank for and let them know that this is the new version of this. You know, that yeah. version is no longer available. Yeah, but, you know, I let, know, let them try to purchase on the spot. I know from our discussion on Friday, Hamlin doesn't agree with everything I'm talking about here, but yeah, especially no, on the uh, when it's end of line, I think he handles it a little bit differently. So yeah, I'm sure he is. yeah, no, I I I I prefer to use redirects. So what I do is I have the redirects to find first an equivalent page and try to redirect that page that does no, no longer exists to that, that, that equivalent page so that the user is going to find it, you know, a similar product. And if there isn't, then redirect it to the parent category page. What I don't, what I definitely advise clients against is trying to redirect a bunch of, you know, pages that don't exist to the home page or even to a single page on the site, like working with a client that they did that and they redirected everything to an index. And, and, and happen what I expected. What happens when you do a massive number of redirects to a single place, either the home page or one category on the site, Google will label those redirects as software force. And um, 
And there are tricks that you can use, you know, to make the user experience better. Like when you implement the redirect, you can cook with the user so that when the redirect, when the user lands on the on the destination page, you know, you can have a banner or a flag saying, you know, this product that you search for is no longer available. This is, you know, a, 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 a similar product that you might like or if they land on a category, you know, tell them, you know, that, you know, the product they were looking for is not there, but but this is a page, page they can find. Similar yeah. product. And yeah. that way you preserve that way you preserve the link equity of the page, you know, then instead of having this this uh, these four oh fours. Yeah, uh, no, on, on the four oh fours it really for me it just depends on whether or not there's any internal links to them or you know, so on and so forth, how you handle that. Um, I personally, you know, we, we, we've actually developed a couple uh, pages where people on when a product is expired and no longer going to be available or no longer carried, if there is a replacement for that, we allow them to purchase it right there on that page. Um, we make sure it's not a duplicate page by just adding the product or product description but leaving the original uh, that it ranked for. And it really just depends on the business situation though as well. Um, if, you know, it's something that's no longer being carried and you don't have anything similar to it, then redirect it, sure. I guess it was yeah. business, business. How important yeah. is that traffic and ranking for you? Yeah, we did something similar to what you're saying for a client that where the, the, the pages were not specifically product but promotions. So they were running promotions and what we had them do is, you know, instead of deleting the promotions that are no longer active, just create a promotions page that is always gonna be the canonical page. So every new promotion, every old promotion you redirect it to that new one, you're saying uh, uh, this is this is a promotion is no longer available, you know. Go to go to this page. That's one option. Another option that we are, we have tried as well is in all promotions, uh, we provide a, a lead capture form. You know, we we have an opt-in email saying you know this product is no longer here, and we assume that it's just a temporary shortage of the product. You know, sign up uh, with your email, and we'll let you know when the product is is available. And that way, you will keep the page. And then, you know, when you have the product, you have an announcement list that you can make, you know, and you can get all these people that try to buy it at some point. You know, because, you know, they, they go to your site, your product is not available, they just hit the, you know, the back button, and then they'll find somebody, some of your competitors to buy, and then you lost that contact. If you keep their email, now you have an option, you know, later on, they might need the product again to, to just uh, blast them and say, you know, we have the product and available. And we have limited quantity, you know, first come, first serve, you know, and then you give them uh, an incentive to act quickly and buy the product if it's uh, uh, a hot selling item. That's what I've done in the past, too, is I want to get them in the system and then let the salespeople uh, keep track of things and keep that uh, client, you know, or that customer informed and keeping them. Because with the guitars, it would be, uh, it's hard to get them to do this stuff because uh, you never knew when they were actually going to run the new line and have stock again. Uh, they waited until they had so many orders and they didn't, you know, it was, everybody was waiting. So a lot of times that's why we use the strategy of when we're getting short, we up the price because we know later on there's going to be a shortage for a while. So to just maximizing profit. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next thing. Uh, I wanted to talk about is uh, structured data and wow this hour has gone by really fast. So, uh, uh, 15 minutes late didn't help, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> well we'll go a little over, how's that guys? I don't know, can you I'm hang ready. in there till quarter after or so and then we can make up for at least the 15 because this is a pretty lengthy topic sometimes. I'm good. Okay, so uh, in regards to structured data, I used a little bit on uh, uh, an e-commerce site. I know Wiss has done more of it because uh, he has a, uh, a recipe site, I believe, that he works with. I'm sure Scott's used it because he's just, I know he's that type of guy. And I'm sure the same with, I don't know about Hamlet, how, how strongly he feels about it. So we'll start with uh, Scott and see what he has to say and then move on to Hamlet and Whistle. I am an absolute huge supporter of structured data, 100%. So 
as long as it's legitimate to use on a page and legitimate to include, then absolutely use it. Um, if it's not legitimate to be there and you're just trying to, you know, influence things unjustly, I'd honestly recommend staying away from it. We've actually seen people that have been hit with it, uh, from what we can tell. Overuse of structured data, took a ding, removed it, and then they popped back up. So that's one thing I would actually just recommend being very careful of is make sure that the structured data you're going to input in there actually fits what your page is about. If it doesn't, don't don't even try it. So in other words, just if you're not sure things. how to use that structured data, don't just go putting a bunch of stuff on the page on the page figuring it's going to help. Well, I yeah, guess, I mean, I guess it doesn't apply absolutely. I guess, as Carl, you're talking about, you know, people like don't really have reviews and they make them up, you know, Mark tell the Google that they're, uh, there is some black hat going on on the review side. Well, uh, reviews, location bases, things of that nature, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, and, and that's that's one of the reasons why Google, I think, uh, a couple of months ago, they updated the guidelines, just, apply, you know, giving a specific recommendation so people don't spam uh, with, with structured data. Um, I'm also, you know, 100% with structured data. I've seen tremendous, you know, uh, the CTRs that I've seen with uh, clients that, that have implemented the reviews is a, it's, it's fantastic, like 30% increase. That's the minimum that I've seen. And it's the fastest way that I've seen SEO results. You know, like when we're talking about results, you're talking about weeks, months, you know, this is, you're talking about days. If the clients already have the reviews and the reviews are extractable, you tag the pages and you, uh, most of the times you have to whitelist the site, submit to a form to the site when Google approves the, 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 the reviews, uh, and they enable them on the site, a massive increase in CPR because now you have really compelling uh, uh, search snippets. Um, and specifically on the search snippets, um, I'd like to recommend, uh, obviously in commerce sites you have the product, yeah, you have the aggregate reviews, you have, and I also like to recommend the breadcrumbs. The breadcrumbs that you have on your site, you can tag them with structured data. Specifically, it has to be our DFA. Oh, look at, uh, at, at Scott's uh, baby. <laughs> the, the SEO dog. <laughs> so, so as soon as you go, yeah, so, so uh, the breadcrumbs are great in the sense that you get now, instead of just one link to the specific product page, in the search results, you have multiple links. You get the product page, and you get the, the breadcrumb links as well. So I'm a, a big fan of it. Uh, some, uh, which, uh, with a client, a couple of clients, and uh, we were doing something, you know, really uh, sneaky with it. With it, with it. It's, it's, it's not against the guidelines, but it's something that I haven't seen a lot of sites doing. I probably should have mentioned it because it's, it, this is going to be public, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. It is public. That's why it was going like this. Oh, okay, okay. I won't mention it then. Okay, I won't. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, with the structured data, it's, it's fantastic. It's a uh, big fan of it. Okay. Yeah, when uh, on Search Geeks, uh, we had the SE, well, not SEO, the developer from uh, Best Buy who they implemented. Uh, I don't know if it's RDFA or schema. I think it was RDFA. Yeah. One of the things that he noticed was he was a lot more visible, i.e., people coming and scraping the, sh the site for data. What do they do with that data? Well, they make it visible somewhere. So you could almost say it helps ranks by making you uh, scrapable, especially for a store like Best Buy. That's huge makes it so much easier for affiliates and stores and all kinds of people that just, you know, scrape good data off their site, increases their visibility. So again, it's the perfect SEO uh, uh, technique in that it attracts links. It doesn't build links. We've actually, that's a double-edged sword though as well. We've actually seen people that have had their data scraped of that nature that actually had links within their data that then got penalized with a manual action from Google because people were scraping and then uh, republishing their content with links pointing back to them. They thought, oh, that's going to be great. 
They also had a bunch of links mixed in from the uh, the data they would publish on Flickr that people scraped and they would link wow. back. That seems you were penalized and actually called out within Google, you know, Google Webmaster Tools and manual notifications that yeah. oh. these are the bad links. That's simple. Oh. Wow, that's you, know, uh, that's you get that also with uh, PR and uh, press releases, eh, Scott? Mm -hmm. uh, it got so bad towards the end uh, before uh, Panda, I think it was, that I actually made up a, a, a formula to calculate scrape rank on wow. uh, the news art, the news press releases we were doing because uh, you know you get two or three links on that site, but There'd be like literally thousands uh, that had been scraped and from that single press release. So I mean, I mean, your developers they they could uh, selectively present the structured data only to Googlebot and Beanbot because yeah, they they can modify that on the back end and 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 selectively only present that to Google and avoid that scraping and and. And any determined scraper, it's still with, without the structured data, it's going to be able to scrape it anyways. Because you, you, you uh, scraping data is not a big deal. Oh, you know? but it is now. It is now <laughs> with, uh, with an IP. <laughs> I said my new uh, system was going to be, I'm going to start a service that does nothing but guest posts on the crappiest blogs I can find, and I'm going to link to nothing but competitors. Uh, yes, but you, but you guys haven't seen the, the recent federal court ruling in the U.S. in regards to using uh, cloaking or proxy services to actually access websites now? Oh, I haven't seen that. You, you post a link? That would be interesting. Uh, yeah, it was on, I believe, Artista, or, uh, Artista the, the, um, the security blog, basically stated the ruling came down effectively stated that if you access a website using a proxy, it can be deemed illegal behavior. Because of the uh, the Craigslist case, where the guy was uh, continually scraping after they blocked his IP, used proxies to go ahead and uh, gain access to the data, regardless. Uh, it's pretty much it's case law now, so it's something to take into consideration when you're doing that too. Wow! There you go, boys. Stop doing it. It's now a case so, law. Uh, you never you just know how this well, how, you can how always, turns out. You can always blame a hacker in China, right? <laughs> or, or hire one, or hire one. Yeah, even better. Mm. You know, after you go to Fiverr and buy a thousand plus ones for five dollars. <laughs> you're 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 paying. You're only getting a thousand. I was getting ten. <laughs> well, that's a different topic for another <laughs> show. To increase your rankings, right? Well, I increased his social signals, but no, I would never use anything like that to do that for a client. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to a good way to waste your time, right? Uh, a good way to waste your time, or possibly wind you up in a little hot water somehow. Mm. One of the other things that's uh, becoming, uh, I don't know, uh, becoming an issue is, I don't know if you, uh, anyone else here on the panel has noticed it. But I'm seeing the knowledge base just literally filling up uh, the top of the cert to where you're you don't see transactional sites there anymore, and that's really hard on e-commerce sites that you know. Yeah, I we've been seeing a lot of more. Well, it's I mean it's just it's segmentation. I mean we talked about this over a year ago where you know Google with with Panda especially I mean it's almost you know it's taken a. a the top level categorization are you transactional site or are you research oriented site? And if you're research oriented, then you know they want to go ahead and put you at the top of those queries for what they interpret to be research only type queries. And we've seen a lot of e-commerce sites fall fall by the wayside that way as well. Um, I, I mean, for me, it's it's intensity query. We change and add a you know a buy or something like that to it and the results completely change of course. So you're you're getting those transactional sites showing up at the top. Yeah, it's just getting a lot uh, harder to do it. And I think uh, one of the reasons for adding structured data is you have a better chance of uh, getting into those uh, results with it. So uh, you know that's a, another kind of bonus. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I am a little worked up about the plus one thing. Stupidity just bothers me to my core, uh, especially when it's misinformation being 
propagated. Sorry for my rant for today. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about here? Kind of went through this pretty quick this week. Uh, <laughs> well, we, I mean, we, we didn't argue enough? Just finishing up the topics. Uh, uh, the one thing that, uh, do you, one thing that I really stress on a website that becomes a problem, especially with duplicate content, is I want brands front, brands front and center. I think people search more on brands than they do on keywords. People that are ready to buy, I mean. Uh, if you're in a transaction mode, you know probably what the uh, uh, model and that sort of and brand that you're looking for. So though, that's why I really stress uh, brand search on, a, on the site, that when people search on the site, that those brands come up where they should. And, uh, and that, uh, oh, now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, and that they're prominent in the uh, uh, navigation. So I always put the brands right at the top of my uh, structure. So the first thing that a search engine sees are the top 10 or 15 brands on an e-commerce site. So because I know the sooner those links appear in the page, the more weights put on them. So uh, uh, how do you feel about that, uh, Scott? And start with you and then go to Hamlet. Uh, I mean, personally, I mean, I, I think in certain situations, people definitely search for brands above product types, but in other situations, I think it's the reverse. Um, I'm a huge proponent that your homepage and the main landing page is really not something I concentrate on for SEO as far as, like, you know, content, things of that nature. Really, for me, it's about conversions. We'll make sure it gets a lot of good inbound links to that page, and, I mean, it should rank for a lot of things regardless. Uh, we found that the less text we put on home pages, the better they rank to begin with in most cases. I mean, these are conversion points for me. They're not pages I load down with, with heavy amounts of content. So, you know, as far as, like, putting your brand there, if it's good for your users, absolutely. But I wouldn't write a bunch of text about it. Um, the only reason I brought that up, and it may seem like it's straight a little bit, is just because I just dealt with this about three hours ago. <laughs> you know, someone wanted to write a paragraph for each one of the brands they were going to have housed on their home page, and I was like, Why? No. So we can oh, wait for oh, it. I'm like, Jesus, come on, people. Yeah, I'm just talking about links across the, the top yeah. that make it really easy for people to find the brands on the website. They don't have to search. They don't have to look. They're right there, front and center, on every page. Yeah. And no, I, no, agree I agree that I agree. the less you put on the page, my PPC pages, if they are if they scroll, I'm, I, I'm pissed. I want to fix them. Well, see, and the thing is, I've seen I've seen it work well in both directions. I mean, it depends on the site. Some of you know the the ugliest sites that people scroll down along the salespeople letters. They, they convert so well for a certain type of market. Yet other ones, if you got to scroll at all, people will never see any. You know, I mean, one of the you know I'll, I'll use Edmonds as just an example. But back in 2004, the Edmonds homepage used to probably be about six or seven screens down the entire homepage, and you know, we fought tooth and nail in over a year just to be able to get a list of links for the for uh, for uh, manufacturers there, so Ford, Nissan, you know, so on and so forth. Finally, when we got it, it was three quarters of the way down, so it was you know, you had to scroll a continual amount. But when they looked at the click analysis, people actually scrolled down to find it because this is how they actually wanted to search when they landed. They knew Edmonds. They came to the site. They're like, okay, I know what I want. I don't know what kind of car I want, but I know I want a Ford. Or I know I want a Toyota. I know I want a Honda, whatever that was, they searched out for that simple type of navigation. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm yeah. a firm believer. And uh, Hamlet, you? Yeah, I. Uh, when it comes to brands, uh, I don't think that most people search for brands uh, because if you think about um, how it, where is our structure, informational, navigational, transactional, Generally, the brands come into where you're talking about the navigational. And you're talking about navigational and transactional only make about 20% of all the queries. But when it comes to intent, 
And you know, I, I come from an affiliate marketing background, you know, and one of the tricks that affiliates we use is we try to rank for branded terms because they convert better. You know, you know, brand brands have higher purchasing intent, and it's generally, you know, uh, an order of magnitude bigger conversion rate when somebody's searching for a brand, including your site or a brand of one of your products they're more likely to buy versus, you know, when they have just searching for a description of your product or, or a branded term. So it makes a lot of sense to try to emphasize uh, brands across your site and your navigation. And, and some of the simple things that I even recommend clients is make sure in your titles you include the, the site name, you know what I'm Because just with site name in your, in, your, in your titles, you're capturing more branded terms that if you don't capture them, you have an affiliate network, you know, your affiliates are going to try to rank for them and steal those keywords for, from you or, 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 or PPC competitors. Um, so branded, you know, it's brands, you know, high purchasing intent because users are more close. They already, they are, they, when they type a name of your product or your, or your company, they are expressing familiarity with your, with your business. And, um, so they have they have a foot in the door. Yeah, that's uh, my kind of attack. Is like you said, when people are searching by brand or, or model, they've made the decision, uh, or they're in a uh, the latter stages of the uh, buying decision. Exactly. Uh, and that's why I, I key on that. Like to me, I always found the worst converting pages were category and subcategory. Like. They always go somewhere else from those pages because there's just too many options. Well, Ben, I also look at brand as a category. You know, a particular brand right. is a category in a lot of ways. So I'll have a home page for Gibson or Ford or whatever it is. If it's an actual brand, I'll have a home page. It will be a product listing page, but it will, you know, highlight what it is. Will be designed for conversions, and hopefully we can rank for that for that brand there as well. Yeah. yeah, that's often, too, uh, if I have content around a model or brand, I'll also put links to that content from that brand page to yeah. kind of tie everything together, right? And what we've been doing with, with e-commerce as well is we've been looking at creating stories now, um, actual kind of the, a storyline of our involvement with this brand and how we represent it, why we like it personally, and this is why we sell it. Not just this brand is you know located here, blah blah blah. None of that you know the standard stuff. We actually give a lot of, of storytelling now to the brands. I mean, one of the we we did some work with um, one of the larger kind of bathroom tile manufacturers out there that does a lot of you know high end custom stuff. And one of the big things from their marketing department that that came out of it, and again they had no idea how to do anything with this, was the fact that this you know designer that you know turned manufacturer you know had a story, a history. And what we did is we made sure that that was represented across all of their products. And this helped make them have unique product descriptions from every other distributor that, that sold their stuff. Yep, especially when you get brands yeah. like uh, Slim and Beer here in uh, Canada, you know, storied history. They sold to uh, Al Capone, sold beer to them, got kicked <laughs> out of business for 50 years. <laughs> uh, that sort of thing. And now they have commercials. Uh, saying what do we have in common with Al Capone <laughs> makes people stand up and uh, take notice you know well sure I mean even some of the best commercials out there on the market in my opinion are from Geico oh definitely <laughs> they have nothing to do about buying insurance but you know you sure remember that brand yep especially the way that it ends is kind of accentuating the, the brand that's quite uh, you know, when you see where they actually uh, play those commercials, you can see that they're targeting an audience for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Okay, well, we're up on a, being an hour, so we're filled the time and got it all in. Uh, once again, uh, thanks to Hamlet and Scott for sharing some uh, tips on doing the e-commerce. Uh, you know, the uh, this is not talked about very much in the SEO community. You hear lots of stuff about content. You don't hear too many people talking about how they rank shopping carts and stuff like that. And I think there's a reason for that. It's not easy. 
I think it's a lot tougher than people uh, realize. I agree. Anyhow. Okay, well, thank you guys very much. I appreciate it, and uh, I'll be happy to come back if you guys ever need me. Yeah, Scott, we'll have you back on for some others uh, in the future. I know that, uh, you know, you were lots of fun on the other one. Same with <laughs> you, too, Hamlet. Anytime uh, yeah, you same see here. you're doing something that you're interested in, you're always welcome. And good, good, good to see you again, Hamlet. You too, Scott. Great to see you. I see yeah. you're, we're, we're both getting bold. Yeah. <laughs> Get in there, yeah. <laughs> hey, it's on my all, way. You know, what's going it's on up here? Just birds we're gonna have out. the bald SEO pros uh, hangout. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll blame I'll blame the screen though. I, I started losing mine a long time ago. <laughs> I'll be labeled the rookie. <laughs> okay, then, folks. So that ends another SEO pros helpline. I hope we've helped you out, and of course, as we always end, go make lots of money. Okay. okay. See y'all later.